joining us today. I'm your host, Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And we're excited to have you with us on this February 21st uh, session of the Small Business Bootcamp. As we like to do, we like to start out, if you're new, we like to start out by recognize, recognizing all of our community partners. We couldn't do these boot camp sessions without their time, their effort, and their expertise. Again, those that are new, the Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses prepare, plan, and grow. It is a statewide initiative supported by all our community partners. And not only is it our Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. webinar that we do, it is a content library and a series of workshops with our community partners. Um, the workshops we just had last two weeks, we had two of our workshops. One was with the Department of Revenue. And you can find a recording of that one uh, in our content library that I'll talk about here in a second. And the other was a live in-person session with the Phoenix Business Journal um, that was last week. That one was not recorded, um, but uh, we are doing more with them in the future as well. So keep an eye on that. So when we talk about the content library, the content library is where we house all of our recorded webinars. <clears throat> Excuse me. And from the beginning of the boot camp, we've recorded over 250 webinars and have them loaded in the content library. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> so on the content library, you can go in there at any time, access all the previous uh, boot camp webinars and some of the workshops and review that material and those slide decks at any time. Um, you can copy the link, share it with friends. There's no cost to access it. Um, and as you can see on the screen, there's seven different categories, accounting, finance, business, resources, et cetera, that uh, you can sort by to help you navigate through that uh, content library, those 250 plus recorded webinars. Additionally, the ACA has a number of programs that can help support small businesses. We have our Small Business Services, our Workforce Division, and our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, on top of these programs, we have our Small Business Checklist. This is an online interactive tool that helps entrepreneurs identify the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, you can also find additional information on business planning, procurement, marketing opportunities, et cetera. There are a lot of great resources in the checklist. And the checklist is a very detailed um, program uh, with a ton of information. However, if you need a quicker answer, not as in-depth of information, you can use our virtual assistant, Sally. You can see her picture there on the screen. Um, Sally can help you find the quick answers to some of that stuff. But if you need more detail, dive right into that checklist program and you can get a lot of great information. I additionally want to share some business updates with you. Um, the ADOT Business Development Program is currently accepting applications. And they just opened that up to applications. Um, also, the FedEx Small Business Grant Contest has launched. Um, and it is a national contest, but you know, you can take your shot at it and maybe get a chance to, to win that grant. Also a quick note that the Maricopa County 1% loan has ended. Uh, so that loan is no longer available. <clears throat> also it's tax time. So uh, start working on your taxes. It's uh, very important as many of you may have experienced during the pandemic that if your taxes weren't current um, or accurate or uh, your books weren't prepared to, to do your taxes, that some of the programs that were available were more difficult to access. Um, we're gonna post a link that the IRS has uh, for small business taxes. Uh, they have a bunch of great resources, so we're gonna share that information. <clears throat> and then SeedSpot, which is a local accelerator program that started in Arizona, is also now has some base in Washington, DC is starting their startup spring training. Now this is a no cost program that they are doing. And I believe the boot camp will actually be part of that for a couple of weeks. Um, you'll be able to get some of the credit on that. If you take a look at that program, there's different ways to score points um, or move along the bases of the uh, baseball diamond. And 
the boot camp will be in there in some way. So that was some great programs. And then finally, we were asked to share this information about the economic census. Every five years, the uh, Census Bureau does a business census as well. Um, and so uh, we were going to share this information so you are aware of it, so you can uh, fill out the proper information on census.gov uh, for the economic census. With that, we'll look at our upcoming sessions. Um, this evening at 6 p.m., we have a Spanish language boot camp session. So if you know any Spanish speaking entrepreneurs or business owners, please share this information with them. And then next Tuesday, we'll have digital marketing during a recession. Um, Google My Business, and this is our friends at Local5. They've been on with us before and they're going to share some Google updates. It's uh, really about Google My Business and the updates um, that Google has made recently uh, that you need to be aware of. So this is a great session to attend as well. And then the following Tuesday is developing a marketing strategy um, to help your business. So with that, we're gonna jump into today's session. We have our friend Tanya Keats, the founder and coach at Keats Coaching. I met Tanya a number of years ago at a local event and uh, she does a great job. And so we asked her to come on and uh, she's gonna share her expertise with us today. So Tanya, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll let you share your screen. Excellent. Thanks so much. Great to great to see you guys again or to see you again. It's been a really long time. And I believe I am sharing now. Not yet. We don't see it yet. I have to click the share button on that screen. Do you got me? Oh, there, it is. there it goes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, as Robert mentioned, I'm Tanya Keats I'm with an organization, have an organization called Keats Coaching. And I am here today to talk to you or to have a conversation and a dialogue about resiliency. My background is I was in corporate America for a really long time. I'm doing various things, working for various organizations like Waste Management, University of Phoenix, um, Banner Health, um, um, various different industries doing process improvement, efficiency, program and project management, um, and then ended up on transitioning to having my own business. Um, it was a different business. I realized it wasn't the industry for me, so I got out, and then I started Keith Coaching and have been doing that for several years now and thoroughly love it. Not only do I coach um, people who are in transition, people, teams, companies, organizations, individuals that are in transitions, but I also do speaking engagements, um, integration guide, and then I also do consulting. So let's get on to resiliency. So as you can imagine, um, advance, life happens. And when I say life happens, it's not like I'm living life. It's like bad things happen, right? Things happen in our lives. And that's what I mean by when I say life happens. And it's not a matter of if life is going to happen. It's a matter of when life is going to happen and how do we respond or react to that. So follow this scenario with me in your head that you want as minimal as possible things happening in your life. And to do that, you've decided that you are going to pretty much stay in your home. You're not going to have interactions with other people and you're just gonna confine. And you're probably gonna watch a lot of TV. That's gonna be your main source of entertainment. I don't know if anybody can relate to this scenario, but let's just imagine this scenario. So, and the reason you're doing it is so you can stay super, super safe and not have life happen. I mean, what could go wrong in this scenario? The internet or um, the internet could go down or cable could go down or there could be a power outage due to weather, due to a glitch in the system. And now what? 
in your safe bubble. Now what? Life has just happened to you. So I want you to keep this scenario in mind. If you don't happen to have a life happens situation that's happened to you recently, but I would like you to also visualize a graph. And as you, we start off on this graph, right, life is going along great, and then the power goes out. And how long you stay down on life happening, or how far down you go on this graph, how, how, what does that look like for you? How far down do you go, and how long do you stay down? When you recover, how far up do you go? Do you go back up to where you were? Do you go to less than where you were? Or do you go up much higher than you started off before this particular event happened? Just a note, if you go higher, that's a growth opportunity for your resiliency and, and your energy level as a human being. So as we're going through um, this resiliency of going up and down, and in most cases, people want to go down very low and bounce right back up, almost like a rubber band. But I am guessing at times in your life or in employees' lives or vendors' lives or personal families' lives that an event has happened and they've gone down and they've stayed there and they really never came up. And they may have stayed there for months or years um, and then something else happened and they went down again and kind of stayed there. And then, you know, those people who things happen, big deals happen. And they're just like, bam, right back up and better than ever. So part of resiliency, now that we've got a visual of what resiliency looks like, let's sneak a peek at some of the things that are characteristics of resiliency um, and, and get a better idea of how resiliency comes about. First of all, resiliency is all about preparation. This is about doing your work, working on yourself, incorporating those tools before you need it. It just becomes a part of your life and a part of who you are. Think of first responders. They prepare physically, they prepare emotionally, they prepare with their, their tools and their skills, right? Every fire is a different fire. Every emergency situation is different but they have prepared themselves like crazy. They have practiced and practiced and practiced so they don't have to think, oh my gosh, what do I do in this situation? This is very similar to how you can prepare and live your life of resiliency is very much like a first responder. You don't wait until the issue happens um, before you start practicing it. The second thing is that this is a skill, which means it can be learned. This isn't some magical pill or genetic disposition that somebody happens to have. This is a skill that can be learned. Think of it like exercising, right? We exercise for various reasons. We exercise to be healthy, um, for, right? To prevent long-term issues. We do it for weight control. We do it so we can physically go and do whatever we want with our friends and family and kids. Um, as far as activities, and we know and have the confidence and have the strength to be able to do that or to be able to move in weird situations that aren't part of our daily life without becoming injured, right? It's a skill that we can learn that we prepare ourselves for. The third thing about resiliency is that it's contagious. People get, tra you transfer your resiliency and more importantly, the behaviors and characteristics that you've prepared for, they become contagious to your coworkers, to your company culture, to your vendors, to your family, and to your friends. So those are three interesting things about resiliency. Then let's take a look at... Um, at a few um, other pieces around how our resiliency comes to be on where we're at right now. So I would like you to get out um, your phone, um, open up a new document on your computer, um, you know, um, use your fingers, use your hands, or go wonky and get like a piece of paper and a pen and make two columns, um, column A and column B. 
And I'm going to read through a list of things. And every time you say, oh, I do that, I want you to put a tick mark in that column. And I'll let you know when we start a new column. So you guys ready? A, B, and then you're gonna do a tick mark. So um, first column, you're passive. You avoid things. You disengage. You blame yourself. You, you socially isolate yourself. You may drink a little too much. You may have thoughts of suicide. You disassociate. You may have a little bit of depression now and then, or a lot. Same thing with anxiety. You may have a little, or you may have a lot. That's list A. Go ahead and tally up your tick marks. You've got your total there. Excellent. Let's go on to column B. Put a tick mark by anything that you notice that you do. You're active. You are socially supported. You use positive reframing. You vent. You know others and are known by others. You have intimate connections. And this isn't just sexual, just intimate connections. Um, you're present. You can be in the moment. Um, you know your values and your boundaries. You have stress management tools and you're a problem solver. Go ahead and tally up your tick marks on that. And out of awareness, just look at which one, which list has a greater amount of things that you have a tendency to do versus the other. Is there one that you have more activities that you engage in versus the other? Are they about the same, right? Just take a note of, take a note of that. Um, these are all coping strategies. And coping strategies are obtained from our sphere of influence and it starts when we're a child. And our coping strategies keep us alive and they make us the people that we are today. And whatever has brought us to today, we are incredibly grateful for those coping strategies because one, we're alive um, and, and we're, we're somewhat functional. Um, we're here today. So thank you for showing up. Um, but these, these sphere of influence um, usually start off with your family. Then it generally goes to teachers in grade school. It goes to your friends. It goes to your coworkers. It goes to the people that you are choosing to spend time around and the environments in which you choose to be in and spend your time. And you absorb these things naturally, right? Nobody usually sits down and says, when this happens, then you do this. And then when this happens, then you do this. Very seldom is that how coping strategies are ever learned. It's just by watching and saying, ooh, that worked for them. So I'm going to do that. Um, so that's what coping strategies are. So studies have shown that the coping strategies in list A are negative coping strategies that do not facilitate resiliency. List B studies have shown those are positive behaviors that facilitate resiliency. So as you're looking at your totals, if you've got more in A and you want to be more resilient and bounce back up when life happens, the good news is, remember, this is a skill. It can be learned. Not only do you have now a list in B of these are things that I can now incorporate into my life to become more resilient. Remember, you've got years of, of, of behavior that your neural pathways in your brain are now being programmed, right? You've got these um, deep grooves that you have traveled down and used time and time again that have brought you to who you are today. And with time and practice and dedication and commitment, you can learn other activities and build new neural pathways in your brain 
to be able to be more resilient, making it become a part of your life and who you are, the preparation that's needed in order to be resilient when life happens. Uh, so let's take a peek at not only this list of um, you know, possible tools, let's look at understanding what your triggers are. How do you know that you even need to become resilient? And part of that is knowing your triggers. And this is, triggers could be something like an eye roll. It could be a tone of voice. It could be um, words that are used. I don't know if any of you have preteens or teenagers. Um, I'm sure you may be able to relate to some of those. <laughs> um, or even people who have carried those behaviors on into work. Um, right. So those are some of the things that may be triggers. But how do you know that those are even triggers? One that may be obvious and you just go off the charts and you can just feel it. And then there's those situations that aren't quite so obvious. And that's where you use these particular tools on identifying what those patterns are. How do I know I've even been triggered if it's not super obvious? And those are things like, um, are you feeling like out of sorts or a little bit weird or, you know, something's just off, right? It's having that internal awareness of identifying those patterns. Could it be that you are a little bit irritated or that you're antsy or that you have less patience and you're super short with others? If you're monitoring your behavior, you may start seeing some of those patterns. And instead of just saying it's an off day, it may be, hmm, this may be an opportunity for resiliency that I don't that I don't know about yet. And so let me dive further. The next piece is implementing some tools. And this is really diving in and exploring what your triggers are. And this, now mind you, all tools are not created equal and all tools are not gonna work for everybody in every single situation. So for example, a hammer is fantastic at pounding things in, pounding things in. Um, but you could use a shoe, you could use a rock, and they're all going to accomplish the same thing. So different tools to accomplish the same thing. We're human beings, we're not robots. It's all gonna look differently as far as the tools that we use. The second thing is that a hammer isn't gonna work so well getting a screw in. And so now you need a different tool in this situation, but it doesn't have to be the exact same tool. It can have variation just like the hammer. Um, so that's just a preface as far as tools go. So you've now realized that, ooh, I think I might be triggered because I'm noticing some patterns, but now what, right? Thanks, Tanya, but now what? And so the now what is identifying what you're feeling and being triggered isn't a feeling, that's, that's a, a, a state of being. And if you, are, if you are like me, I had an issue understanding what are feelings because antsy is not a feeling. Um, so you can Google um, list of feelings and you can get a list of feelings. I actually have a list of feelings that sits on my desk that I go out when I start noticing some of, that I go and look at when I start noticing some of these types of behaviors that, ooh, I'm just not feeling right. Let me look and see what I'm feeling. It may sound stupid, but it really does work. It gets you into a problem solving positive mindset as opposed to um, that self-talk that may happen on you're not good enough or right, you're just overreacting or blah, blah, blah. Um, Fill in the blank, whatever your go-to happens to be on that. On that, um, So then it's a matter of identifying what is it that I am feeling? The second thing, as far as utilizing the tool, is saying, hmm, when did I start feeling this? Right? And then it's going back and looking at your day. You know, it's like, okay, this is the feeling I'm having based upon these these responses that I was doing, like being antsy or irritable or short with people. Um, and so then it's a matter of when did I start doing that? I did that about two hours ago, huh? And the feeling I have is frustration, right? I'm frustrated. 
What happened two hours ago? Was I in traffic? Was I in a meeting? Did I have a particular phone call? Did I have a particular interaction, right? What happened a couple hours ago? And then it's a matter of, huh, a couple hours ago, I um, was walking to the bathroom and I stubbed my toe. Oh, now I know that my toe, right? My toe being stubbed caused some frustration. And there's no judgment that goes around this. It's just an observation of here's what I felt and this is the observation and I believe what led to this particular feeling. Step three in that exploring your triggers and implementing your tools is why am I giving this thing so much power? So stubbing your toe, right? Or it could be an eye roll or it could be, right, that tone, right? In theory, an eye roll is just an eye roll until you put meaning and power behind it for your resiliency to go down and for life to happen. And I'm using small situations because starting off in these small awarenesses help build and prepare you for those big situations. So, right, so what is it that you're giving? Why are you giving so much power to this particular thing? And that goes back to looking at our sphere of influence. Is this a, a, a neural pathway that, that you have ingrained that is personal to you that when so-and-so did an eye roll at this point in time, or every time I've seen somebody do an eye roll, it's been vindictive and it's been demeaning and it's been this where this person may just be doing an eye roll and it doesn't mean any of that. Um, or could it be your sphere of influence? This was a trigger for them. And so you have adopted that without it really being a trigger for you. So there's exploration. Like I said, there's no one answer, but this is an exploration for you to identify why am I giving this particular trigger or action word, it may be a scent, it may be a sound, so much power. The next thing we can do is ask for assistance, reach out for assistance. Tiger Woods is one of, one of the greatest in his field, and he has a swing coach, right, to just talk to him about his swing, because sometimes we can't see our own swing. We can't get out of our own way. And that is when it is super important for us to find a trusted, confident sounding board that has your best interest in mind. And this can look many different ways. It can be an individual, it could be a group, it may be a book, right? And this is just somebody to give you that outside perspective of what's going on. And as you hear this outside perspective and the questions that they're asking and the phrases that they're using and the word choices, now these words and these thoughts and these questions become a part of your toolkit for you to be able to prepare to be more resilient. The last thing you want is to have an umbilical cord relationship with this outside assistance where you have to go to them for certain things. Ideally, this outside resource is, is building your toolbox for you to be have um, um, an independent relationship with one another. And now you're just going to them in the worst case scenarios. You know, it's like, I use this hammer on this screw and it's not working, you, it, it, you need another tool. And so let's explore what some of those tools are. Go ahead and try them out. And then let's see which one fits for you and that works in your, in your life for your personality and your situations. Um, then it's a matter of creating successes. And as we're creating successes, um, that is when we are disempowering our triggers. This is doing something to resolve the triggers. This may be having difficult conversations in a way in which you can be heard. It may be being very present in, in where you're at and physically and emotionally available. It may be knowing what your boundaries are. It could be creating, implementing, and taking action, which all of those can be action, 
Now, mind you, the action may also be you doing your work to be aware of what's going on. That's an action in and of itself. It's not always some big grandiose, I need to have this conversation or I need to do this. A lot of this work and action is internal to yourself. So clients have often told me that and given me some great feedback that when they change their mindset around being resilient and going into those positive behaviors and implementing these tools, that they feel absolutely empowered. So I'm going to ask you, what is the cost of not being resilient for you, your family, and your organization? What is that looking like for you? And with that, I open up the dialogue for questions, for comments, for examples of situations that you may be having. Um, the floor is wide open to be able to have dialogue and to explore resiliency. Now, now's the time to be able to do that. Anybody have any questions? You can either post your questions in the Q&A or you can, if you wanna raise your hand, um, there's a little icon on the bottom on reactions. You can raise your hand and we can bring you on um, as a panel so you can ask a question live uh, to Tanya. So um, yeah, please, please share those questions. I'm not, or is it participants there? Um, so here's one um, that I'm going to give you to go ahead and start things off. Um, when you came today and knowing that this was about resiliency, what was your definition of resiliency? And has this changed or has this completely aligned with what your thoughts were around resiliency? Robert has, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick on you because I can see your face. <laughs> Has this shifted um, your thoughts or ideas around, here's what I thought resiliency was, and now here, and here is what um, has shifted for me. Yeah, and I like your activity you did with the two columns, um, you know, as the coping responses. Um, that, that was a good activity. I, I, I like that. Um, fortunately for me, I had more in the, the, the positive column. Um, Yay. so that, that was good. Um, but, uh, I think that was a good exercise to get people looking at, you know, all those different categories. All right. I, we do have some good questions, Tanya, in the, uh, I see the that chat, or in the Q and A. I see that. At what stage do you decide you need outside help? Um, great question. When you are spending more time and energy on bouncing up than you can afford to is a great time to reach out for some type of help and assistance. Did that answer your question? I, I don't mean it to be vague, but that's different for everybody. So please follow up if um, that didn't quite get it. Anytime you're spending more time and energy than you can afford to, is a great time to say, hmm, let me do something else. Um, the cost of not being resilient prevents you from missing opportunities. Oh, love that, love that. Um, if Once again, that gets back to you're spending more time and energy on something than being able to live your life right? You're spending more time in that negativity, trying to figure it out as business owners, right? And being in the business world, we know we've got plenty of things to figure out and um, being resilient is only going to help with those things. That's not one area that you definitely can afford to um, um, spend that time and energy on because I need to learn a new program or I got to figure out this new tax law. <laughs> or this new requirement or something, something. 
Um, next one, finding what causes stress rather than just trying to overcome adversity as it presented is something I need to do more of. Mm. Great awareness, um, which reminds me of that resiliency, right? People who may have stuff happen and they bounce right back up, right? Sometimes it's putting on our BS filter and saying, are they really getting back to life or are they just putting on a happy face? And really deep down, um, they're not doing the work. And I think that um, we can all, let's take social media out of this, right? And not even look at the social media aspect. But if you're having really interesting and intimate connections with people, then you're going to be able to know, right? Something's not quite congruent. And I think they may be putting on face. Um, anything. And, and if you guys want some follow-up or additional conversations on these, by all means, let me know. Um, should I look to sometimes scale should look to sometimes scale to to judge you have enough tools to be left alone. Hmm. How do you evaluate yourself? Judging is never a good thing. Um, as far as judging is comparison, there's usually not a lot of negativity. Um, so do I have enough tools? This is going to bring me to a concept of, it's not about how many tools you have that wins the game. It's, are you using the tools? And are those tools effective? So it's a different question. Um, it's not about, do you have enough tools? One, are the tools you're using, are they working? Right. So if you're using a hammer and you're like, I can't get this thing in a hammer, but if I switch to a rock, oh my gosh, I have complete success. Great. Then do you need a hammer, a rock, and a shoe in order to get the hammer in or in order to get the nail in? Probably not. You found one that works in this situation. And yet again, another nail may come along and that stone or that rock may not help in that particular situation. Um, so it's about, do the tools that you have, are they doing the job in the time frame you want them to? I'm hoping that's asking or answering your question. Um, how can you get out of analysis paralysis? <laughs> oh, a person of my own heart. Um, it's by taking action. Right, so on that one slide, it's about taking action. And if you're not taking any actions to resolve the triggers and you're not noticing that you're getting better and better and that your um, time and energy isn't spinning, then you're making progress and you're not in analysis paralysis. I'm hoping that makes sense. All right, um, how do we handle the awareness that we are truly resilient, but stressed or tired from continuous battling to remain so? Oh, fantastic question. Um, this I think falls into the field of energy management. Is that one, utilizing the tools, and it being a part of your life, it doesn't become as exhausting as when you're learning them. So that's one piece. Where are you at on the learning curve? Are you in the part of the learning curve where you're just starting off on some of these tools and right, they're not just part of who you are? And so that's one thing. Um, as a learning curve, you're gonna probably be more exhausted because you're using a lot of energy. And um, the other piece is that if this has become a way of life, and not to say that you're not always making improvements and that there's not always new triggers out there. Um, and all triggers aren't the same, right? An eye roll may throw you off, throw you down off the charts, um, that may throw you off the charts. And yet a death of a beloved, you may be able to bounce right back from. So all triggers are not gonna have the same response. And all triggers are not going to always have the same response. So, right, so an eye roll one day 
may be no big deal. And another day, an eye roll may throw you off the charts. There's a lot of things that fall into that. And these are the basic things that we all know, right? Sleep, exercise, nutrition, right? Um, various other things that happen in life. Um, can go ahead and turn something that was a, a, a quick bounce back, a quick rubber band into something that's just dredging on. I'm hoping that answered your question. Um, please follow up if I'm not answering the questions or if it triggers something else for you and not like in a bad trigger, but another question. <laughs> um, my business is in its infancy. Oh, bless you. Um, <laughs> To me, being resilient has a lot to do with being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I struggle with creating success part or being satisfied with results of using the tools that I have. Wow. Um, we want it all, right? We want the tip of the iceberg. We want the Olympic gold medal. And um, we don't necessarily understand the small wins along the way. And this is part of that um, is, is truly, I would say, absolutely being vulnerable and maybe redefining what success looks like. Success may not be, I got this particular account or this business or this sale or this client. It may be, you know what? That was super fun. Or it may be, wow, I didn't have to do nearly as much preparation for that presentation as I anticipated or I had in the past. It may be redefining what success looks like and making it on your level of success. Um, and then it's a matter, um, so I'm hoping that answered it. And then it says also a result of using the tools. Um, right, the tools aren't going to give you on the top of Mount Everest tomorrow. They're going to be slow steps going up there. That's where that preparation comes into place. A firefighter on day one, it's a lot of preparation that happens before they go out and do it. Um, so be kind to yourself. Um, that vulnerability also includes being kind to you um, and knowing what those differences are and possibly redefining success. Um, I'm hoping that that speaks to you. The cost of not being resilient is not teaching or showing my daughters. Oh, you touched my heart. Yeah. About how to be resilient. Um, this is a generational thing. Um, um, first responders have a tendency to use coping mechanisms that aren't necessarily um, the most positive for resiliency, even though they look and sound like they're resilient and those behaviors get passed on, those coping strategies get passed on generation to generation, um, which ends up on usually leading to very similar things without them being a first responder. Um, it is one of the most important things to um, be in life. If you know how to bounce back quickly and not live in the down, I believe you will be happier in life. Yes. Um, you need to find out what gets you out of your down and what gets you back on track. Teaching kids how to be more resilient will always help um, them in life. Absolutely. Um, another point that this brings up, that your comment brings up, absolutely, you are absolutely true to my heart, is um, I lost my thought. It'll come back. Um, um, when you say teaching kids on how to be more resilient, um, another thing is being grateful and doing something, doing acts of kindness for others is another way to get yourself out of the, like I said, it may or may not work for you, but being grateful, waking up every day or going to bed every day or when, right, life has happened and you're in the muck of it and possibly in that pity party. It's a matter of what can I be grateful for in this moment? I can be grateful I'm not homeless, right? I can be grateful I've got clothes to wear. It can be, I'm grateful that it's a beautiful, bright, sunny day out, or I'm grateful that it's, it's that we've got weather and it's raining um, or that there's clouds in the sky. Um, so being grateful is another way, another tool to also um, get out of, of, of the muck. So thank you, yes. Um, 
if you come across someone who is constantly losing their balance, great phrasing, or I don't know why, but I'm not able to say that word, um, aggravated or aggravated on how you tactfully advise them um, to get some coaching, you certainly do wish, you certainly do not wish to hurt their feelings. Um, one of the things that I've realized is most people don't like being told what to do. Um, and even as tactfully as you may um, want to put it, um, it may be more of using your own life and situations as an example. One, they're often able to hear it better because it's not about them, it's about you. Um, and um, using examples of other people's situations, it's kind of like watching a movie or reading a book. They can now bring their defenses down and they may be able to relate. So for example, um, I'm just making stuff up to see if I'm understanding this question correctly, is um, let's say you've got a, a kid, a brother, a sister, a significant other who is just in this negative, negative space. And as you put it, consistently losing their balance. Um, and you're tactfully saying it. It could be a situation that comes up and you would be like, oh, I can so relate to you. I know when I was in, um, you know, when I have felt like that before, I've reached out to so-and-so. And the reason I'm so grateful that I did that is because, right, I spent less time and energy and I was able to resolve that and be able to spend my time and energy on things that are super important to me, my family, my work, um, doing self-care. Um, so those could be examples as opposed to telling people, I know two-year-olds don't like being told what to do and 90-year-olds don't like it any better and anywhere in between. Um, so that may be a way of gently, gently encouraging um, some self-care and different action. Because when you're on the other end of it, right, it's a matter of, oh my God, this is a broken record. I can't listen to this one more day, one more minute, right? It's the same thing again and again. As we said in our family, shit or get off the pot type of thing, right? It's a matter of do something because I'm just going to. Um, anyway, I'm hoping that answered um, your question. And please come back um, with some more questions um, if you need clarification on that or if I was completely off base. Um, you're welcome. And I believe the reframing was possibly on redefining wins. Um, I'm trying to correlate um, names and questions together. Anything else come up for anybody? Ah, awesome. Thank you. Fantastic questions and not necessarily a discussion. I felt like I was on a monologue, would have loved to have had to, conversations with y'all, but I loved um, the curiosity and the examples um, and the vulnerability that you presented on the situations um, as far as being in the question. So I'm grateful and thank you for that. Yes, thank you for those great questions and, and sharing that experience and feedback. Um, uh, great session, and we're okay to, to give everybody 10 minutes back in their day to, to do some positive stuff. Um, so, Tanya, thank you so much for this presentation. Great information on, on resilience and, and improving that. And again, thank you to all the attendees for your great questions. Uh, that was a very good Q&A session that we had, and I appreciate that. Um, the Q&A always helps others. Um, if you have the question, somebody else probably has it too. So. Uh, thank you for asking and sharing those. We do have one more comment. Oh, someone said thank you in the Q&A. And if um, anybody wants to have any further dialogue, by all means, please uh, please reach out, um, right? Even if it's just to say, hey, I've got a quick question on this or um, see if, if um, right, just by all means, reach out. Would love to be able to see some faces and hear some voices along with um, those that are on the participant list. Robert? Um, yeah, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up and give everybody some time back. Again, thank you, Tanya. Thank you to all of our participants for being here with us today. And uh, with that, we will give some time back to the rest of your day. 
And we hope to see you in our next boot camp on next Tuesday. And until then, have a great week and uh, be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, guys. Bye. Bye.